look and see how this is used in removing a task. Okay, so here's remove task item. Bring your attention to the end of this method first. This is a call into the asynchronous interface object that we've created. So I have a task list service. I call remove task. That was one of my methods to call back into the server and actually remove the task from the model. Pass in the task ID that I want to have removed. And then that second parameter was that async callback object. If we uh, just look up a little bit, we'll see our creation of the async callback. And essentially think about this like you would when you're writing a typical Ajax application. You would have some sort of a callback function that would be available. So that's what this represents. This is an object that will be called uh, as soon as we get some sort of return back from the server. So we create a new async callback um, function, or excuse me, object and it's going to have two methods on failure and on success so in our on success is uh, where we would actually then go ahead and remove that row from the GUI now that we know it was actually removed from the the real model perhaps the database on the server there's one last thing that we need to uh, add and that's in our configuration file I need to add this servlet element and this is going to be used again for that RPC communication. It's going to have a URL and what um, what servlet needs to be uh, invoked when that URL comes in. So in this case I have task list persistence as my path and the class is going to be my task list service impl. You'll note that the path that I have listed here is the exact same one that I had in my service interface in this remote service relative path annotation. So those two will match. Okay, so let's run this and see what we get. So now what should happen is when I click on the delete button, it should use this RPC functionality to call into the server and it'll give us just an output message that says, yep, we removed this. So I'm going to delete my third task. And you'll see down in my console window, it says on the server, inside remove task and the ID that was passed to it. So that just shows me that, in fact, it was uh, removed. It then called back into our async callback uh, object and then finally removed it from the GUI that we're seeing here now. So the third task was removed. So that's how you add RPC functionality to your GWT module. Let's look at one last thing briefly, and that's internationalization. The process of internationalizing one's application is simply to remove any hard-coded strings, any hard-coded dates and times and currencies, anything that would change from locale to locale. So the way that we do that with our GWT module is not all that different than how we would do this with a regular Java application. And by that, I mean we will create resource bundles. So before we do that, let's look at our configuration file and see what we need to add. We need to add an element, another inherit, so that we get some functionality. And we will use uh, Google's provided i18n GWT module. So we add that. And I'm going to add an extend property for a locale um, to say what other locale I'm going to be supporting. In this case, I'm going to be supporting uh, one for French. And it has a value of fr. So I add that to my configuration file. Next thing I want to do is define the uh, strings that I need. So I create a, uh, a properties file. In this case, I'm calling it to-do list constants. And the extension is dot properties. So let's take a quick look at the source code. It's a simple properties file, name, value pairs. On the left side is going to be my key name. This is what I'm going to use to look up a particular string. And on the right side is going to be the localized value. In this case, my default property file is going to send back a string localized in English. I create a, another file. It's almost identical in name, but this time I have an underscore and then the language uh, code that I want to use. So I'm using fr for French. And if we take a look at that, we'll see the same key names as we had before on the left side, but on the right side, it's localized in French. So I create as many resource bundles as I need um, to handle the application. 
Then I create a class called to-do list constants and you'll note that the method name is the exact same names and spellings, case sensitive and everything, as you saw as the keys in my property file. So I have task name, due date, edit, delete. If I look back at one of the properties file, see the same thing on the left side. Task name, due date, edit, delete. So those are my constants and what I'm going to do is instantiate this interface to do list constants uh, using a special hep helper uh, object in GWT and I will use that then to look up a localized string. So let's see how that looks. You'll see that I've created a to do list constants uh, interface and I am able to instantiate that using the gwt.create method, pass in the name of that interface. And now instead of hard coding the strings that I need, I call into that interface, pass call a method with the name of the key that I want, and that will return to me a localized version of the string, either in English or in French in this case. So let's test it out and see if it works. Okay, so now we're seeing all the strings there in English. Um, that's how it looked before. Now I'm just going to pass in on the query string a locale of French. Locale equals FR. And I click that in. And sure enough, we get a French version of the uh, module back. So that's how you're able to uh, localize and internationalize your GWT module. Very, very simple. So I want to conclude with just pointing you to a few advanced topics. This is something that you'll want to do more research on as you become more fluent with GWT. Um, first of all, keep in mind that the JRE that's being used when you use the uh, hosted shell and browser, um, it, it's an emulated JRE. It's not a complete Java JRE. So you'll want to check the Java doc reference to look at any limitations with that emulated JRE. Also keep in mind if you need to call into other JavaScript libraries that you may have written or maybe a third party library or have those libraries call into your JavaScript into your GWT module that you'll want to learn the JavaScript native interface, JSNI. There's lots of different widget libraries and projects happening and one of the best ways to find out what's going on is check out the uh, Google group called Google Web Toolkit. That's the first link I have on this slide. Also check out GWT-EXT. That's kind of an impressive uh, project of um, that's using GWT to add some very sophisticated widgets. A couple of other good books on this subject, uh, GWT in Action, GWT in Practice. And of course we have classes here at Intertech. Classes that are related to what I've talked about in these three parts include Complete Java, Complete Java Web Development, Complete Ajax, Complete Spring, and Complete Struts. You can find out more information about these classes at www.intertech.com. As I mentioned in part one, you can download these slides and code examples at www.oxygenblast09.com slash events .htm. So that concludes our introduction to the Google Web Toolkit. Thanks for joining me.